Well, greetings everyone and welcome to another episode of Healing Ties 2.0 featured on the Whole Care Network and on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the Bowtie Guy. On this episode of Healing Ties 2.0, we visit with Jennifer Hinuis and Xander Craig. Jennifer and Xander are two social workers embarking on an ambitious ambitious project to bring trusted resources to LGBT caregivers. I know you are going to love their story of hope and resilience. Well, greetings, Xander and Jennifer, and welcome to this episode of Healing Ties 2.0. It is great to visit with the two of you today. Thank you, Chris. It's great to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Man, I've had the opportunity to visit with you two separately, but never together on a podcast. So uh, sometimes it's a little difficult juggling and it's okay to interrupt each other, but it is really great to, to have both of you. And as I'm prone to do with all my guests, and you guys can decide who wants to go first, how are you creating healing ties? Well, they always say ladies first, so <laughs> Jennifer should go. I, my four older sisters have always told me that too. So, <laughs> well, so I Jennifer, think, you're on the spot. <laughs> yeah, so I think we're going to be talking about that a lot probably throughout the podcast and just the, the nature of how Xander and I started to collaborate, right, and come together around our new initiative. It's really, I guess when you say, you know, how are we creating healing ties, that just the very nature of our relationship, I think, comes to mind for me. If, if I can add something to keep it outside of that, right, to, or to add to that, I recently joined, I've only been to one meeting, but I recently joined a men's caregiving uh, circle that meets in person in uh, Orlando, Florida, where I live. So I, they're, the second meeting is um, this week. So I'm going to be going to it. And I, so that's, it's like, for me, that's, this is the first time that I found myself in a, in a network of caregivers in person that are all men. Uh, I found it really rewarding. So I'm looking forward to going back. Ah, that's a, that is kind of a phenomenon because usually uh, we associate caregiving with uh, women, but there are men that are caregiving. But, uh, you know, Jennifer, you, you intrigued me with your healing ties. Uh, Tell us how how did you and uh, Xander meet? How did uh, tell us sure. about this? Yeah, so we have kind of an interesting story because we are both social workers. We both have experience having worked for the Department of Veterans Affairs. But you know, the VA is a really big place, and Xander and I just didn't know each other. But uh, we both actually worked at the national level on LGBTQ policy, and um, just at different points in time. And we connected really through LinkedIn about um, almost two years ago, probably now. And um, we just, you know, connected around social work and that sort of evolved um, because Xander is caregiving for his father and Xander was navigating some VA health benefits. And so we connected around that. And I'm also a long distance caregiver for my father and both of our fathers are veterans and both of them um, have dementia. And so we just had some things in common and um, we started talking about the lack of resources that were specific to the LGBTQ population. And um, we really just got together around that and thought, you know, how can we work towards amplifying these vo voices and uh, making it easier for uh, people to find needed information and resources? And that's really the genesis of how this LGBTQ Caregiver Center initiative came to be. It's almost like you knew each other without knowing each other. <laughs> well, <laughs> and we, 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 we know people in common too, which is, right. you know, mm -hmm. that you learn along the line, along the way too, which is that there's, there's a lot of connections. Uh, the social work world is very large, but you know, for some reason, you know, even when you get on a platform like LinkedIn, you've realized, oh, we're connected to a lot of the same people. Yeah. And you, you find out through your stories that uh, there, when it comes to caregiving, no matter if you're 
what side of the fence you're on. I'll just I'll just use that that term. That there are no strangers. Mm-hmm. Caregivers uh, really connect with each other and their stories. And I you know and I didn't know this. I kind of knew it about the two that you both worked for the VA, but I didn't realize that you didn't really know each other until you started talking about uh, this project. But uh, I you know Xander, tell our listeners a little bit about your caregiving story. Sure. Well. I mean, the, people might be able to relate to this, that it was an unexpected uh, turn of events. My, nobody in my family has ever had dementia, at least not in my immediate family. And it, it might be also that most of my family members have died in their 40s from heart disease. And so nobody, nobody aged into an age demographic where dementia might be showing up. So my... Um, my father started to exhibit some symptoms of memory loss that I just chalked up to, you know, getting older. I, I was never in gerontological social work. I, um, I also don't social work at home, so I wasn't bringing my social work lens uh, to my relationship and my conversations with my dad. And so it just, what happened was I, uh, I started talking to my father about moving to Florida from California, where we were both living at the time. And uh, he kept saying no, that he wouldn't move to Florida. And then one day he said yes. And I thought, I wonder if something's wrong with my dad, because he was adamant that he would never leave Southern California. Um, but my wife and I really wanted to move to Florida, but I didn't want to leave my dad behind. And so eventually he said, sure, he'd come with us. And I'm, I'm, I'm wondering now, in hindsight, if he was starting to realize that there might be some issues going on. Because another thing that was was a, a signal, I believe, was that he sold his car before he moved out here. And so he was consciously giving up his independence, which is not mm-hmm. something that people usually have to take the car away. Um, right. So he sold his car and he moved in with us because his his offer to us was let me move in with you and i'll be like your live-in butler i'll do all the grocery shopping and the cooking and the cleaning and and i was like wow that sounds great sure dad um and then within about three days of him moving in i was like i said to my wife something's not right with my father and so the story basically evolved and so i i recognized that i needed to get him into the va and um, get him checked out by the gerontological clinic, you know, at the local VA in Jacksonville, Florida, where we were then. And they did the assessment to find that he probably has dementia, right? And so but what I mean by unexpected also is that my father, in, in my growing up years, my father was the, was the smartest, um, strongest, uh, boldest person I knew, right? Like my father had a photographic memory so he could remember everything. So I just mm-hmm. chalked up a little bit of memory loss to old age, right? Um, but then, it, it, you know, it's like slowly but surely, it it, it, it was like, oh my gosh, I, I think I'm a caregiver now. Like it just sort of happened. It, it was, right. yeah, it's like it was just sort of thrust on me and I was like, I don't know how to do that. I'm a social worker, but I've never been a caregiver. I've done caregiver assessments at the VA and I've counseled caregivers and I've, I didn't know, I didn't know what was expected of me. I didn't know how to fulfill that, that role. And, you know, it's a little bit of on the job training, really. I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. And so not being able to find resources was some somewhat of a, you know, it just made the journey, the original, the starting part of that journey more difficult to not be able to find access to people who could relate to how is I'm a trans man, right? So my father knew me for 39 years as his daughter and now for the last 16 years as his son. And I was thinking about like, how's this going to impact his memory of me? And like, am I going to, he's not going to know where his daughter is one day, you know? So it got me thinking about who else is dealing with this. And I, I really couldn't find any place where there were people mm-hmm. sharing these experiences um, out in a somewhat public uh, venue. So, Wow, goodness, thank you so much for sharing that. And it's, um, you know, move from California to Florida and all everything that entailed with that. And, you know, being a social worker like both of you are, but then I guess it's, you know, it's one thing to be a social worker and uh, be able to provide information and referral to clients but then when you're 
when the roles reversed and you see it from the other side, it gives you a different perspective. Absolutely, because now, right, then all of a sudden I'm accompanying my father to his VA appointments and I also am a veteran, so I also go to the VA. And so I'm pretty adept at navigating my own situation, but now I was having to navigate for my father and um, and then COVID hit, right? And so <laughs> everything got more difficult. Yeah, everything but, has gone up in the air with that, yeah. But it's, I, I can't tell, I, 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 I can't know for sure, but I'm willing to go out on a small little limb and say, I don't think a lot of people like when the social worker shows up as a family caregiver <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> because we're, we're going to be really on top of things. <laughs> you got that right. Oh, I put my old so social worker shoes on, th on this conversation. This is great. But, you know, but Jennifer, uh, long distance caregiving, that... That poses a whole other set of issues and concerns. Yeah, you know, it's, it's really hard. And, and I was that geriatric social worker, right? So when I was in VA, I worked in geriatric primary care and I worked in hospice and palliative care. So I was that sort of social worker trying to help families navigate the system and then sort of the same thing sort of was coming out of nowhere. And there was a lot of denial really happening in my family around what my dad was going through. And, um, you know, it was more obvious to me, I think, because I was long distance and because I had been trained, in, you know, in some of the signs and what to look for. And when I would have my weekly conversations with my dad over time, I could tell that something was wrong, right? And I think, you know, my parents are separated and my dad's wife, um, I think for her, my dad is actually her caregiver, so that's one thing. So my dad has dementia, oh he's a caregiver for his wife who has Parkinson's. But I think because she's so close to him and they're living together and everything that um, it was easy just to sort of fill in the missing pieces in my dad's conversation or when my dad forgets something, it's easy to say, oh, don't you remember this and that? And so for her, I think she was just really not seeing it, even though she was living it every day. Right. And for me, when I would have the conversations with my dad and, and we would be constantly repeating stories. And uh, finally, when he came to visit, you know, he couldn't recall objects and would be like right. pass the thingamajigger or you know i you know and it just sort of all started to come together and it took it took years actually for for me to kind of work from a distance and and say okay like you really need to get into neurology dad you really have to make these appointments and um i found myself calling the va and other social workers and i didn't yet have all the releases of information set up and i knew they couldn't talk to me so i would be one of those annoying social workers Xander was talking about as a daughter <laughs> saying hey look i know you can't talk to me right now but listen i just need to tell you everything that's going on because i can tell you you just can't tell me yes, so right. this is what's happening <laughs> so, so it's really um it's been a challenge, but I think, you know, over time and, and gotten him all the neurology examinations and a brain scan and all of the things that have gone on now, it's clear what's happening, but there's still, there is still some denial, you know, that my dad right. is, it has not really fully there with this diagnosis. With this. I'd be uh, interested to know, you know, I'm an old social worker myself, but, uh, uh, how do I want to ask this? Uh, when the roles have been reversed, when you know, you're, you're in front of a, you've been in front of hundreds of clients and you're helping them, and and now all of a sudden you're the client. Yeah. Uh, uh, I guess what I'm looking for here is the, you know, the you know, let me backtrack. It, social workers are drawn to help one yeah. way or another. But then when you become the when you become on, on the other side and you look at it through the different lens, I mean, how does how does that help you in your work with other with your clients? Well, for me, it's, it's a path that I knew was coming. Right. So mm -hmm. I know what the journey has been like. I've been supporting caregivers for almost 20 years and for me, it was daunting because I know the stress and challenges that these caregivers face and I knew I was gonna now be faced with them myself. 
right? Mm-hmm. And I, I, so it was like, okay, this, that now is my seat at the table is coming for me now. And, you know. Very well said. Yeah, yeah. I, I just, I knew where we were headed. <laughs> and Xander, yeah. you have something like to add to that? Mm-hmm. Well, I, I worked as a medical social worker in a primary health clinic, and when I was doing so caregiver assessments for people who were maybe going to get referred into the caregiver program, these were younger people, right, because they were post-9-11 veterans that were probably, you know, they were needing care in the home, primar- usually with a spouse being the, the family caregiver. And so what, going through the assessments to determine, is this person capable Are they qualified? Are they actually going to be available? Um, Can they fulfill the role? You know, when I started to think about the questions that I was asking and I turned those questions on myself, (laughs) you know, (laughs) can I fulfill that role? Am I qualified? Do I have the time? Um, And then knowing all the resources that are available through the VA and getting my dad plugged into, say, adult daycare and medical respite and home health services. And, you know, I knew that there were things that I could take advantage of. But it it, it's also, you know, as social workers, I see my primary role as a social worker. One of my primary roles is to help people learn how to navigate systems. And, you know, so, you know, both Jennifer and I worked at the VA. And as you can imagine, your listeners can imagine, you know, systems can be complex. Well, think about a federal government bureaucracy system. (laughs) Right. And think about the the sort of siloedness of, of how different services and departments Right. The lack of communication between services and departments and and then referrals out to the community. And it's very, very complex. And so going from being a person who was helping patients learn how to navigate systems. Now, I was navigating a system, but not for myself, for another person. And so I was being like all the different obstacles and all the different barriers, right? Like leaving six phone messages for the social worker of the geriatric clinic and never getting a call back and then just showing up. And by that time, I had power of attorney and for medical decision making and financial and legal and everything else. And I'd be like... I would just show up and be like, I need to see the social worker Um, and like not getting not being able to to see that person and going a month or two without that. And so and then having people say back to me, oh, you're you know, your dad was in for the appointment and everything seems to be okay." And I'd be like, can I come in? Can I come in? Because I want you to ask my father what year it is. I want you to ask my father to take his shoes and socks off. I want like. And so, of course, my dad's like 1988 and he hadn't cut his toenails in eight months, right? Like, it, like they weren't seeing it because my dad is very, very personable. He's very smart and mm-hmm. he can he can do, you know, he can fill in the blank like Jennifer's father with the, you know, the the doohickey, the the whatever, you know, like the word. He doesn't have to say what the thing is because he can just point at it. And people don't know that that is a symptom of of Alzheimer's or dementia, right? Right, because they're just not, they, they're, they've not dealt with it. They just, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, and I, I'm a firm believer that uh, uh, the best information and referral usually comes from people that have been in the trenches and you, you're, you've you been in the trenches on both sides of the fence here, both uh, as a social worker and as caregivers. And you've really embarked on a very, very, wonderful and ambitious program about getting information and referral out, especially to the LGBTQ community. And I'd really love for you to talk uh, in depth about uh, about your new endeavor that's uh, starting up. Go ahead, Jennifer. Okay, sure. So we, you know, as I said, we kind of came together and we really were just hoping to raise awareness, right, about the unique challenges that LGBTQ caregivers face because having been in this circle for such a long time in the caregiver space, in the community caregiver space, we just don't hear about it a lot. There's not a lot of organizations that are really addressing it. I mean, there are some major 
big ones like SAGE and AARP certainly does a lot around LGBTQ caregiving, but in the small local, you know, community service centers, I think that we just don't see the visibility. We're not finding, you know, the information and resources sort of really in these small pockets in towns. I know, Chris, you had actually even reached out to us to see if we were aware of um, LGBTQ right. friendly providers, right, in, in Florida, because Xander and I are both in Florida. So there always seems to be like this underground network going on of how LGBTQ caregivers are trying to find information and resources that they can trust that are vetted where they don't have to have the fear of discrimination of, of services. And, um, you know, with the Caregiver Wellness Collective, Inc., which is the a nonprofit that I started here in Florida, I really wanted to be sure that we were clear that our services were welcoming and affirming and were for all caregivers, right? All of our diverse caregivers to be welcome to be who they are, that we were a safe mm -hmm. space. And in talking with Xander just around that initiative and then just really wanting to have a, a genuine, out of a genuine desire to try to be helpful amplify LGBTQ caregiver experiences and voices and try to pool together um, some uh, like a one stop where people can go to find resources we thought would really be helpful and is something that really isn't being done in a in a big way really and when it is it's got a, a heavy focus on seniors so like my local area here in Tampa Bay, they have an LGBT, you know, senior initiative. Um, right, very but active. Not, uh. Yeah, it, that they're not really meeting with folks that are under 65. And for, you know, the typical oh. caregiver in the LGBTQ uh, population from what we know from the National Alliance on, on Caregiving is that the typical age is 42. So when right. they're having their focus groups and meeting with people and all the senior service agencies are getting together in Florida, being the greatest you know, state in the country, you're missing out on a huge population of caregivers um, you know, because they're not being included in the conversation. And they need to be in the conversation 100%. I, you know, I, I want to echo, um, there are really wonderful organizations out in the community doing fantastic work. Like SAGE does wonderful work around aging in the LGBTQ population. Um, and they do have some good statistics and some good information around caregiving. And they do a program where they go into nursing homes and skilled nursing facilities and try to right. do like kind of like a safe zone training like they do on college campuses. And there are a lot of LGBT centers around the country country in the United States that have built and are building senior housing, um, it, but they tend to be like, a, you know, a, a, like a studio or a small space. Like what if they have a live in caregiver? Right. Uh, what if they need a live? Like, are there caregiver resources and spaces within those LGBT senior housing programs? How are they how are they integrating in the, the caregiving needs or are they just going to live there until they age out? Or, or medically need to be transferred into a different kind of program, right? And there's a lot of research projects that have been happening um, and will be happening around caregiving and LGBT population, specifically around dementia, Parkinson's. And so we, we'd really like to see the LGBTQ um, Caregiver Center be, you know, like a clearinghouse for research, you know, uh, a place for LGBTQ identified caregivers to, to get resources, um, a place where um, the Caregiver Collective, um, uh, uh, Wellness Collective, uh, all the wellness programming um, is going to be accessible, like through the Yoga for Caregivers uh, program right. um, that, that mm -hmm. uh, Caregiver Wellness Collective is also um is also heading up so that it's sort of like a multi-pronged, we don't wanna duplicate or replicate what other people are already doing. It's just a matter of bringing all of those different resources and the research and the different groups and making them available. Like Jennifer said, like a one-stop shop. <clears throat> but I think for the most part, this yoga for caregivers is is um, is not something that is readily available, at least not to the degree. I, what is there like? four or five hundred people participating in the yoga for caregivers 
um, program. So it's it's very large group of people. And I'm sure that, you know, I haven't seen anything like it. So it's making sure that everybody, right, because wellness, we all know now, right, COVID has brought to our attention how important emotional wellness is, mental wellness, physical wellness, how it impacts everything. Just our ability to get a good night's sleep can completely throw our life into disarray if we don't, right? So it's bringing attention to and connecting people with wellness resources. Mm -hmm. And I think that's key, right? So that that's really the mission of the Caregiver Wellness Collective is to, it aims to provide holistic wellness education and services to caregivers, family caregivers, chosen family, and also professional caregivers. Because these caregivers have so much in common when it comes to stress, anxiety, burnout, right. overwhelm. They all have, you know, they're all at risk for things like, you know, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, you know, diabetes, all these kinds of different things. Um, and so what can we do around whole health and holistic wellness just to provide, you know, some education and a lot of wellness services, you think about it, are not free. They're, you know, they come with barriers for they, people. They come with barriers, they call large financial barriers. Yeah, large financial barriers, right? And also, you know, some caregivers can't go to a yoga studio. They can't go get Reiki or they can't leave their loved one to go somewhere. And and not all of the yoga studios were able to, to easily convert to an online, um, you know, environment. And so, and also some of these, the typical class when you go to a yoga studio is an hour. Caregivers don't have an hour. So our offerings That's are really for sure. created for, you know, the busy caregiver in mind. Some of our classes might be five minutes. It might just be five minutes of mindful breathing, right, that we're offering. And the feedback that we're getting from caregivers has really just been incredible. And, um, you know, to have 500 caregivers in our community now who are taking advantage of our classes and we've also expanded our classes i mean we started offering yoga for caregivers but the reality is we're offering qigong we're offering heart math we're offering emotional freedom technique tapping i had a caregiver who's never experienced eft tapping before and she told me that every time she went to the doctor's office she'd go to primary care that she would have white coat syndrome and her her blood pressure would be elevated every time she actually started tapping right in the waiting room. She's, and she said now when she goes to her doctor's appointments, she doesn't have that elevated weight, uh, her sorry. elevated um, high blood pressure anymore. And that's, that is amazing to, to me, you know? It's just uh, like one skill that we taught that had a practical implication that somebody went and did had a huge implication on her health, you know? Um, that's just amazing to me. <laughs> so, yeah, and it talks I, about the resources, you know, sharing the resources and, you know, again, you know, caregiver to caregiver resources, you find something out, you, you pass it along. And yeah. I know my listeners have heard me say for years, well, set a daily intention for yourself, even if it's just five minutes. Well, now I have a path where they could use this five minutes <laughs> where they yeah. could go to with the yogas for caregivers. So I'm sorry, Xander, yeah. I, I interrupt you. My apologies. No, 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 I interrupted you. You know, well, a key component, right, or a key issue with caregiving is isolation, right? We can feel mm -hmm. isolated. We can actually become isolated because we're trying to manage our own families, maybe a job, plus caregiving duties, plus keeping track of all, like caregiving duties extend beyond just checking in on a person. You know, it, 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 can, it can encompass a whole lot of decision making for another person. And so because people might think, well, why does somebody need to go to yoga for caregivers and get a five minute breathing exercise? It's like, well, I'll tell you because they could go to Calm or Headspace apps. But guess what? When they come to us and they go on Zoom, they're in community with people. They're actually no longer isolated, even if it's for, for five minutes. They can see the number of people that are involved in that five minute breathing activity and they don't feel isolated. They don't feel alone. Um, it, it, it's, it's as, I can be as simple as that, I th but I think it's, that is humongous. But it, I think it's something people might overlook because it's like, well, there's an app for breathing. You can just sit and do a breathing exercise. It's like, we don't want to be isolated 
all the time. Any little opportunity to connect with other people, I think we should be taking full advantage of just for five minutes even. Well, and so what we're doing, right, because again, we had another testimony from a a caregiver who basically said, look, I've been, you know, my husband has early onset Alzheimer's disease and I've been in Facebook group after Facebook group, you know, reading horror story after horror story, which I just, I, I don't need to read that. I what I discovered, that. That, <laughs> yeah, what I discovered that I needed is 15 minutes of meditation with this support group. Um, and, and my mantra for today is I can make it just for today. I can make it. And that was really kind of mind blowing for me because I didn't consider our group a support group, uh, but that caregiver certainly did. And we started to do monthly social meetups and we're not focused on the typical conversations, coffee chats that are happening in these other caregiving communities. That we're is so fo- wonderful. We're kind of focused in on yoga off the mat and, and what does boundaries look like and going through the principles of yogic philosophy, but then some kind of way tying it back to, um, you know, tying it back to caregiving and then also introducing all these different kinds of wellness modalities is really mm-hmm. where we're kind of focused in on. Can somebody that's in life after caregiving join like myself? Yes, for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, because... I still have remnants of my caregiving experience that trickle in from time to time. So uh, anytime you can find validation, resources, and respite, you're doing good. So, Well, you know, that's an interesting question about can you still participate? It, you know, when I went to this male caregivers group a couple of weeks ago, uh, almost all of them, I was the only one there who was the caregiver for a parent. They were all husbands who were caregivers for their wives. And um, a few of them, their wives have passed on. So now they're, you know, they're no longer a caregiver for their spouse, but they still come because they're so valuable, right? Because Chris, what, what you have is you've gone through the entire trajectory of a caregiving experience. And that's, inval- that's a valuable resource for those of us who are in the beginning or the middle stages of caregiving. Right. So the, right. the kind of the kind of support, the kind of resources, the kind of information, the kind of of um, guidance that you could provide to others. I, I can't imagine how anybody would not welcome that. I appreciate you saying that, Sandra. And I, I you know, there's I my listeners again, well, we're going to say he's going to say it again. Well, I am. And, you know, there's two very common aspects to caregiving. There's a beginning and there's an end. And in both cases, we're not prepared for either one of those life uh, experiences. And I, you know, I, 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 so I, I get it. And that's why I do these podcasts and connect because it's my way of giving back. And I'd, I'd love to come up to Orlando and go come to your group. I think that would be just awesome. But uh, as I say, ahead. I think we should come up with some sort of title. You know, it's like caregiver alumni or caregiver mentors or caregiver like emeritus caregivers i mean because emeritus caregiver i like that emeritus it's caregiver. it's important people it's like if we're all in the if we're all coming together to talk about being caregivers then nobody is sharing the experience of what it's like on the other end on the other side of caregiving what that experience is like because i i think not to be a negative about it but i i bet it gets harder and harder like more difficult or more stressful or i'm sure there i'm sure there are factors that i have no idea of what's to come (laughs) well we can do another show just on life after caregiving i would love to be able to talk about that and uh and share those uh, experiences because uh and before we go to the break i'll just uh leave it with here i i personally believe, and I'm talking to two social workers, I know they're going to get this, so this is really great. Um, uh, I don't, I personally don't believe there's any other social issue uh, in society other than caregiving that uh, has no gender boundaries, no economic boundaries, no orientation boundaries than caregiving. And caregivers, uh, those boundaries are broken down when caregivers share their stories with one another and we find out that you know what we're really not that much different we all just want to care for the one that we love as best as we can so 
Absolutely. Yeah. So let's uh, see. As I tell you, that the first half usually is a little heavy. So we're gonna get to, we're gonna take our break here, and you know I'm gonna put both of you on the spot when we come back. I want to ask uh, one fun fact about to each of you, and then I want to get into just a, a little bit more about LGBT caregiving. Okay. So you're listening to Healing Ties, featured on the Whole Care Network and on UK Health Radio, the world's number one talk health radio. We'll be right back. Hey, it's uh, Christopher McClellan. You just might know me as the bow tie guy on Healing Ties 2.0. On Healing Ties, we visit with people from all over the globe who share their stories because it's through story sharing where diversity meets the road to collaborate in a common cause. And if you'd like to share your story on Healing Ties, email me direct at thebowtieguy at healingties.com. We would love to share your story to your health, happiness, and prosperity. Welcome back, everybody. We are continuing our delightful conversation with Xander and Jennifer. Let's see, I always kind of like to draw this out to give you a couple of more seconds just to think about what your fun fact is going to be, because I know you're just on the edge of your seats, just like all of our listeners know that they're on they're on the edge of their seats they're wanting to know and so you know xander you had jennifer go first earlier so we have to turn the tables we're gonna we're gonna have you go first on this fun fact oh you're into fairies, huh all right <laughs> I've so... been into fairies. <laughs> oh well fairies too but that's a whole other subject <laughs> <laughs> so Quite honestly, I could rattle off about a dozen different really interesting and fun facts about me because I've lived a very, very interesting life. What I will say is something that uh, I find a really fun fact about myself that most people find very interesting is that my first job out of the military was as an undercover narcotics investigator. So, oh my God. <laughs> Um, that's right. a first. That's a yeah. that's a healing ties first. Okay, <laughs> I'm sure there's a lot of stories from that one. Goodness. Oh, huh? absolutely. I mean, just it's it just if anybody is familiar with the show back in the back in the '80s, Twenty One Jump Street. Um, oh yeah. Right, because I was young and I was undercover in um, sort of unusual places like government offices and um, large public. Um, agencies or uh, like zoos and hospitals and municipal utility companies. So I, you know, schools, colleges. So it was very, very interesting. It wasn't out on the streets. Like I wasn't embedded with a Hell's Angels group or something like that. <laughs> wow, so. that depth. That, that is that is that is an excellent fun fact. Jennifer, how are you going to top that one? So it's, 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 I know that one's pretty hard. And Xander has so many unusual and interesting things that he's done. Um, I think for me, like I went to a high school here in Florida that was kind of like a fame. And um, so we had arts classes and all that kind of stuff um, every day. And you had to audition to get in. And I was in musical theater. So I got oh. to do, you know, lots of singing and dancing and sort of love musical theaters, kind of a, a musical theater buff. Um, so that's something that's sort of unique, not a lot of people experience. I did not know that about you, that you had the artistic talents. I'm not yeah. surprised. <laughs> it's yeah. been a long time, but, but well, uh, you know. It's like tying a shoe, you never forget. Yeah. Well, it comes after my father, quite honestly, because my dad is a musician and um, mm -hmm. spent a lot of time, you know, with his art and was a producer, was involved with the Monster Mash that everybody hears about. Oh, my gosh. Point. See, we're, we're really going down memory lane today. 
So yeah, it really comes from him. Yeah. Yeah. Ah, I appreciate you guys sharing that and goodness, uh, you know, to kind of full, come full circle on our, our, our visit today, which has just been just, just ter- delightful. I, I, and I guess I'll pose this question to Xander. Uh, you know, what's different about LGBT caregiving? Well, I, th- I think it depends on like what perspective we're taking, what angle we're looking at. So there's there's the LGBTQ identified person who is providing care, and then there are LGBTQ identified people who are receiving care, right? And mm-hmm. so when you think about the LGBTQ identified person who is receiving um, caregiving, let's say for something you know like dementia, Alzheimer's. Um, as their memories start to fade and as their their capacity for engaging um, in a in a bigger way in society or with their family with their friends right it's sometimes you know a lot of people my father's getting to this point where he doesn't really want to interact with anybody because he you know he he doesn't want people to sort of know that he's struggling um, and so have it when you have somebody let's say you have you know Jennifer mentioned earlier about there's family caregivers and then there's professional caregivers right um, and then there's the uh, you know, sort of like the um, like the 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 partners who are caregivers, things like that. I forget what that's called. Um, but let's say like the professional caregivers. If you can have a professional caregiver who's not LGBTQ identified, but can have some basic competency and awareness around LGBTQ people, our culture, our history, maybe the events in town, right? So that if when you're going out on a walk. You might be able to engage the person that you're caregiving for in sort of a memory lane or pointing out things um, and take it's like it's I don't think it has to be really overt. I think it's just a matter of, you know, knowing that this person I'm giving care to didn't he didn't have a wife. He had a husband. And so using culturally competent language when speaking Mm -hmm. to or about the person. Um, Mm -hmm. So, I, you know, I think it's basic stuff like that. And then just being, you know, you know, I mentioned uh, in the very beginning about being a transgender man and being a caregiver for my father who has dementia and and how to navigate and negotiate through when and if I would imagine it's a more of a when than an if he starts to to not know who I am. He already calls me by one of my uncle's names. So he's he's not always sure who I am, uh, but I'm still, you know. So I'm his brother sometimes, sometimes his son. Eventually, he's going to wonder where his daughter is. And I have to think about things like, um, well, he's in assisted living right now. When he starts asking for his daughter, well, there's no daughter in any of the paperwork on file with the assisted living Mm -hmm. facility. The power of attorney is his son. The medical decision maker is his son, right? The person who comes to visit is his son. So I, I basically disclosed that I was trans to the administration in case he starts asking for his daughter that they can call me. Um, so like having to go through this, this constant, wow. you know, s- disclosure wow. um, mm-hmm. of, right. And, and, and I'm okay with that. Right. I, I'm okay. I'm never going to look like I did before. So I'm going to have to deal with how my father's going to respond to feeling mm-hmm. like he's lost his daughter. And who am I going to become <clears throat> if I'm not his son? He, you know, does he remember he only had one kid, right? So there's a lot of mm-hmm. things to to factor in about being on the caregiver side and then versus right. being. So when you have an LGBTQ identified caregiver, caregiving for an LGBTQ identified person needing the care, I think that's that's a really, um, that's going to be, I think, a, um, a best case scenario, Um Except for when you think about the 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 um, the demographics, right? So Jennifer was mentioning about how there's so many more um, younger caregivers now, millennial age caregivers. Well, a millennial caregiver who's LGBTQ identified may or may not have any knowledge whatsoever of what their 60, 70, 80 year old family member or community member LGBTQ identified person, what they went through. Right. Right. And so they they might have the the sort of the social, but not the historical um, reference, which may or may not come into factor. It might if it's not dementia. Right. It might if it's, you know, Parkinson's or some other, Mm. you know, paralysis where they're more of a physical, you know, caregiver versus, you know, they have physical uh, issues rather than cognitive. So there's like I could probably keep going on and on, but I'll stop now. (laughs) 
<laughs> no, I appreciate you sharing your personal story because it also uh, talks about uh, how important it is in the caregiving setting, whether you're the care provider or the care receiver, that uh, you be as upfront and open about your situation as you can be so that everybody knows uh, and focused on the care for the person who is who is entrusted in their care. So I, I yeah, really appreciate well, you sharing that. Yeah. Think about it also, people who are coming in, home health aides, um, uh, yeah. right? And so do you have to, right? Do you have to like de-gay the house, pull all those books <laughs> off the shelf, take those pictures mm -hmm. off the wall, right? Are you gonna make this, you know, caregiver who's coming in from the professional agency, maybe a different one every time, and they're gonna be really uncomfortable with this picture of you with your partner, you know, that's deceased perhaps on the, like, you know what I mean? Like it's, it's um, there's a lot of different issues uh, uh, that's gonna come to issues. play. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And it's I mean, having I, that comfort zone. Mm -hmm. I definitely had veterans, you know, in my clinic, my geriatric clinic, who definitely were in, you know, I guess recloseted themselves, right? When they started to have right. those home health agencies come out to their homes and, and also just trying to help them navigate with their providers, you know, because they wouldn't necessarily want to come out to all their providers. So it was sort of, again, this underground yeah. network around who can, who can I trust, you know, who, who's going to be okay with my situation and my family circumstances or whatever the case might be. Um, yeah, and that's been embedded for years in our, yeah. especially in our LGBT seniors. And I, I think as time goes by, um, you know, I'm 64, uh, but we never want to forget what our LGBT seniors went through and the, the path that they, that they laid for us. Let all of our listeners know how they can learn more about your project and yoga for caregivers, all this good stuff that you're doing. Yeah, so we just launched a website, um, which is www.lgbtqcaregivers.org. And so you can definitely learn more about that particular initiative and um, who we are and what our plans are. We have several advisors, um, including you, Chris. So Including me, yeah. Yay. So we're looking forward to getting, um, you know, getting with everyone and sort of developing a strategy and how we want to move forward. And a lot of it is dependent upon funding, right? But that True. that's our start and um, for the caregiver wellness collective you can find us on facebook currently under caregiver wellness collective and um, yoga for caregivers has a separate space on facebook so you can find us there we're also on instagram uh, yoga for caregivers is so you can find us there and we also have a group on linkedin where we're connecting with advocates and allies who are interested in what it is we're trying to do specifically around LGBTQ caregivers. So that's another good place for people to try to connect with us too. And we'll have all those links available in our uh, show notes and description. And, and Xander, you have a, a final final word you'd like to say? On our on the lgbtqcaregivers.org website, we're collecting stories. Did you say that, Jennifer? No, we're, that's we're, important. Yeah, we're, we're looking to collect stories from LGBTQ identified people who are caregivers, um, currently or in the past um, about their experience. We, we want to be able to sh have those to share with other people. Uh, we also have um, some information on the on that website about an ongoing uh, research study at Emory University um, in Georgia um, specific to around LGBT caregivers and how to how to make you know how to make trainings, um, how to adapt trainings you know to fit our community. Um, so there, you know, just for people to keep an eye on, you know, it'll, there'll be new information, um, coming. We're looking to add being at adding a directory so that, uh, people will be able to find the resources that are in their home state. Um, so that'll come, that's coming in the future, the directory. I just I love what you're doing. And I might just have a story to add for you guys. You just never, you know, you just never awesome. know. So I, uh, Xander and Jennifer, thank you so much for joining me today. The work you're doing is tremendous. I um, am just uh, honored to be in your company. Thanks so much. Well, thank you for sharing all of our stories, Chris. Thank you for joining us today for this episode of Healing Ties 2.0. And if you would like to share your story on Healing Ties, 
email me direct at the bowtie guy at healingties.com. We would love to share your story on Healing Ties. As you know, I'm your host and presenter, Christopher McClellan. I've created a life to love after caregiving ends by being with awesome people like you. And be sure to subscribe to Healing Ties wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. We'll see you for another episode of Healing Ties 2.0 real soon. Take care. Bye for now.